I met a gypsy. All right, Gypsy Gang, we are back for the annual book review of my 2020 reading. Uh, some of you won't give a fuck. Some of you do give a fuck uh, because I get asked a lot about the uh, the different books I'm reading and stuff like that. Uh, so this is my little annual book review podcast. I'm going to go through probably, uh, well, obviously all the books that I've read, but I was going to talk a little bit about how I do my reading, where it fits in. Is it my goal to read as many books as possible? Like just kind of my whole headspace around it. Um, so yeah, if you're one of the people that, um, yeah, so we'll get into it. Uh, this is in no particular order except for the first book. I'll, um, I'll talk about the first book that I read in 2020. And then, yeah, the rest is just kind of random order. Um, there's a, there's a few, um, there's a, a bunch of fiction. There's a bunch of nonfiction. I probably, I don't know what the split would be, but it'd be pretty close to 50, 50. I feel like I go through stages where, uh, I'm reading a lot of fiction and then the fiction stuff gets, uh, a little bit, I uh, just want some variety. So then I'll go back. But uh, one thing that I think is really worth pointing out to people is that, so when I first started reading a lot, like I've always read a lot, but um, when I've really gone to the daily reading, which has been probably the last three years, I read a lot of uh, non-fiction stuff because I was like, if I'm going to spend time reading, I want to spend time learning while I read. Uh, so I thought that just by reading fiction, I wasn't really going to be getting that much out of it. Um, I was just sort of, it was just like a guilty pleasure kind of deal. Um, but in 2020, this was the year that I read the most fiction that I've ever read since I was a kid, where all I would read was fiction. Um, and I feel like it's sort of the opposite. I feel like in a fiction book, you can learn the whole way through it. Characters are so well developed and i think that because you know like that you'd hear the saying like stranger than fiction i think because these amazing writers are creating these fictional characters they're not constrained to the truth essentially and they can really craft and build these characters to really show like the most extreme version of human nature um that you know isn't always just present in a person people are oftentimes more balanced than that but it's like uh, these characters show you, um, I guess, like the the what's possible um, within human nature. So I think that you can learn a lot more in uh, in reading a great fiction from a great author than what you think. Uh, oftentimes, I find too with nonfiction books that really by the time I'm a third of the way through it, unless it's a really good one. Um, by the time I'm a third of the way through it, you've kind of got the gist. You've got the overall concept. Um, there's some exceptions to that, which I'll talk about um, in a couple of a couple of my favorite books this year have been nonfiction books that made a big impact uh, on me. Um, and then others, it's like, yeah, you can kind of read the first yeah, third of it and then, and then you're good. But I've read everything from cover to cover except for two books in here. One I'm still working through uh, and the other was just, too much too soon i just had to put it down for a little bit um but yeah it's just like a heavy kind of um it's more of like a psychological textbook that you'd read in university than a, a book book um what else was i gonna say there was, there was another point that i was gonna bring up um in terms of the way that i've been reading i think i sort of did the same thing like the last time i did this it was probably a very similar routine uh, but I read every day. I try and read for an hour. I'm not, this isn't like this pile of books that I've got here. It's like 20 something books that I read through the year, 28 or 30 or something like that. But that would, there was no goal. There was no goal attached to that. There was no uh, pressure. I had to read X amount a month. Like I didn't even know until we did this, uh, how many books I'd actually read. So there's none, none of this, the reading that I do, there's no pressure, there's no goals around it. Uh, it's just the process. I just get up every day, I make a coffee, I feed my dog, I sit on my chair and I read for an hour and then 
I go do whatever is planned next. So uh, with like, it was pretty easy to read a lot when I got hurt with my hip and my shoulder because uh, I just I was so limited in physical activity. So I read a lot, and that's probably why I was able to read so many books this year. Um, but the other thing too that was different this year uh, to other years in terms of my reading habits would be the fact that I haven't had a TV for this whole year and people probably heard me say it a bunch of times now, but it just made such a big difference. Like even one of my friends came over the other day um, and there was no TV. We we're just sort of chilling. The weather was shit. So I just gave him a book with some short stories. Um, oh, that's the book that's not. There's another book that's not here. That's right. Um, so yeah, we both were just sitting down in the in the living room reading because I had no TV to watch. Um, so that definitely made a big difference to my reading this year and probably helped me get through a lot more books than I would have. Um, just not a lot of distractions. And I think that was, um, <clears throat> that was one thing with 2020 that I think I learned um, more than anything else was just to like restrict your activities. Like I really restricted myself to only a handful of things and I cut out the Netflix, I cut out TV, I cut out movies, all that sort of stuff. And then you've only got, you know, these five or six things that I'm kind of um, have available to do. And then reading was, was one of those things. So um, yeah, there's no pressure around it. There's no goals around it. It's just a routine thing. Uh, I don't really read a lot at nighttime because it just makes me too tired, to be honest. And when I do read, I want to read for long enough to forget who I am <laughs> for a while. Uh, so pretty much just get into, I guess it's like a little bit of a flow state where I'm gone. It's just the characters, it's the words, it's the pages, and I'm completely lost in the story. Some books really, really, really help you do that. Um, and I'll explain which ones those were. Um, but yeah, so that was the, that was, I guess the reading program pretty much averaged out an hour a day. Wasn't like upset. There was no, I was never trying to keep a streak alive. There was none of that. This is purely enjoyment. There's no, there's nothing around reading that causes me any stress. I don't feel any pressure to read X amount of pages or X amount of books or anything. And I don't know whether other people do. Um, I know there's people that make videos like I read X amount of books in a year or whatever. I read a book a week or, um, but yeah, so this isn't that. This is just what I want to read. So I'll just drink water and I'll tell you about the first one. So first book was Flea, Acid for the Children. Uh, this was Flea's memoir. If you don't know who Flea is, he is the bassist for Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, I would had read Anthony Kiedis' book, Scar Tissue, like years and years and years ago, and it was amazing. This was quite a lot different. Flea is a really, really brilliant uh, writer, very... Uh, it's very random book like it's uh it's you know two page chapters these little kind of mini stories almost like poetry um the way that he writes but very very descriptive and uh you get a really cool look at um i guess what it what it is like to be or why these artists are the way that they are it takes a very special person to be flea in red hot chili peppers it takes a very special group of people that have been through a very unique and individual circumstance to even come together and create something like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So um, really interesting. Like, I don't think it even gets into them being the Red Hot Chili Peppers until, man, like from memory, maybe like 80 or 90 pages to go. Uh, a lot of it was about his childhood. He had a very damaged childhood. Um, and then they got into a, a bunch of drug use. Like there was some gnarly drug stories in there. Um, but yeah, really sad um, in, in places, just the way that he grew up. But it obviously, you know, that sort of is what made him who he is. Uh, I had friends that read it that didn't like it. Um, and I had friends that read it that absolutely loved it. Uh, this, the other thing actually I should have mentioned before, I don't really do audio books. I think I read two, listened to two audio books this year. Um, I'd way rather read. Um, I also, the other thing that I was going to say, one of the things I do as well. So 
I'll read a book. I've got like my little stack of books that are to read and they go over here on my desk at home. And then I've got a Johnny Walker bottle that Miles Muki gave me in the middle. And then on the other side with the title facing towards me, I stack the books that I've read. Um, and then that I always put the one that I'm currently reading on top. So it's like, this is where your pile is going to be. So I don't know. I'm just visual like that, I guess. Um, so that's like my little, uh, little tactic for seeing my progress of reading keeps me motivated, keeps me inspired. I don't think I need it. Um, but I don't know. It's just like a cool thing. It's just like a visual representation of how hard you've worked because it is hard to read a book. I mean, this thing's got, I don't know, like 300 and something pages in it. Um, and yeah, it's not, you've got to work for every single one of those pages. You can't let your mind wander. You can't think about other shit. So you definitely have to earn a physical book. Um, you've got to sit there, you've got to turn the pages, you've got to sit in the right light, you've got to get comfortable. Um, so when people say like, oh, I can't read, it's hard to read. It is hard to read, but that's why you do it because it's challenging. Uh, but like anything challenging, when you do turn that last page or when you've got a few pages to go and you're really trying to like anticipate the ending or see where it's going to go, uh, that to me is such a rewarding feeling. And then when you physically take the book, it's done you plop it on the table and then you've got your next one ready to go. Uh, I just think that's a really great feeling. It's something that I, uh, have really come to enjoy. And I think I'd miss that if I read on like Kindle or, uh, audio books. That being said, Kindle's way more convenient. And if I travel, I buy the book that I'm reading. Uh, like if I need to travel a lot, I buy the book that I'm reading on Kindle, uh, and then I'll read it on there until I come back. But I've always got the physical copy of the book. Um, I don't know. Call me old school. I just like it. Um, I was going to say something else as well, but I forgot about that, but I'm sure I'll remember it. But yeah, so this audio book, Flea reads it himself and he's like reflecting on stuff while he's reading it and he's sort of crying in sections and he's got a really uh, unique and incredible voice. So uh, if you want to do the audio book thing, uh, or you read, but you'd like to read this, maybe the audio book is actually better. I've had a bunch of people say that. that so, um, so yeah, this was the first book that I read and this book really kicked off 2020 for me. Um, we went camping for new year's at Trent's farm, the grass track where we ride. And I just had like the sickest weekend ever. It was the best way to bring in what we found out would be a very challenging year. Um, but yeah, there's no service out there. I had this book with me, I had my bike, my dog, my family, uh, and yeah, just rode. And then when I come in, I'd sit down and I'd read. And there was one, um, one stint between like lunch and dinner where we didn't really have a lot to do. And I read 200 pages or something in one go. Uh, and I feel like, I don't know, maybe that's what just like really kicked 2020 into gear on the reading front. I ended up smashing this in a couple of days. Um, and I was just fired up, ready to, to rip into something else. I don't remember what I read next though, to be honest. Um, I think it was Leela. Um, but yeah, so Flea, awesome book. It was a great way to kick off 2020. If you're into memoirs, if you're into rock music, uh, if you're into anything, if you're into drugs, if you're into sex, if you're into whatever, this book's kind of got a bit of everything. Very, very easy to read. Um, and yeah, I would definitely recommend that book. Uh, I think I read, this is going to be a very random order of books, guys. So these, I've spoke about these two because I think when I did my 2019, uh, book podcast, I had actually, uh, not 2019. I think I did one about all the books I'd read in 2019, but I just read these two. So I included them. So I probably won't go into too much detail on this these two um but this is probably i feel like I, i'm gonna have to go back and read zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance by robert persig again through the lens that i've i guess can now look through after all of the reading that i've done around zen itself uh, around buddhism around non-duality uh and just see how this book reads to me after I'd spent essentially a year studying um, the concepts that kind of underpin uh, this book. When I read this book, I'd read Waking Up, which I'll talk about, uh, and that was, I guess, my first look at non-duality uh, and spirituality. 
Um, but I've always been so interested in, I guess, metaphysics. And for those that don't know what metaphysics is, I guess metaphysics is an explanation of what reality is, where reality comes from, what is the thing that creates uh, the universe, the experience that we're having. So uh, essentially anyone that deals with metaphysics is dealing in like complete philosophy. There's, there's really, it's kind of asking questions about what's outside the box when we're inside the box. Um, but there's some really brilliant people that have these like complete theories um, around what is the nature of our reality, what produces reality. Uh, and Robert Persig had his own complete philosophy. Um, and it really uh, sent, was kind of centralized around um, this whole concept of quality itself. And the fact that you don't really need any concepts around good or bad or, or um, positive or negative or any, you don't need any concepts around experience to know what a quality experience is. Uh, I think the reference that he uses is a hot stove. If you put your hand on a hot stove, uh, it's, you don't really need to know what hot is. You don't need to know what a stove is. You don't really need to know anything about that experience. But if you compare putting your hand on a hot stove with a cold stove, uh, quality becomes very obvious. Uh, so his kind of theory of uh, like his metaphysical theory kind of uh, is around the notion of quality. Uh, but this is, this book I reckon is probably the best example of how a fictional story uh, can teach you so, so, so much. Like there is no real world story that could give you what this book did. Uh, so essentially it is a fictional, uh, book, even though it is kind of with the author, the author's like trying to get his own message across his own philosophy, but he uses a character called Phaedrus. Uh, and then he uses a father and son who are on a motorcycle trip across America. Um, the father is, works on all his bikes himself and he's, he's, kind of found his way to Zen by working on his own motorcycle, learning everything about the motorcycle. Uh, and then the companions that they're traveling with, a guy and his wife, he's the exact opposite. He just wants to pay somebody. He doesn't want to like kind of learn into it, uh, like learn about it or go into um, the whole mechanical side of things. Uh, and then he kind of uses that as this duality between like artistic and mechanical um, and then it sort of just goes on from there. Massive plot twist. Uh, the ending's insane. This is, if people had to ask me what the best book I've ever read is, this is probably it. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, it's on my list. I reckon I'll read it again in 2020. Um, it's a bit of a mission, to be honest. Like, it's a, it's not an easy book. It's four, yeah, it's like, f yeah, 400 and something pages. Um, so yeah, this is, definitely a heavy one but so so worthwhile and i would love to read it again in 2021 um then this is the follow-up book which is called leela an investigation into morals uh it's the same character uh, but completely different storyline and then i guess he's sort of shifted from quality to um to morality and how the two are linked together and this kind of encapsulates or like closes his whole sort of metaphysical um theory uh there's a new character leela is introduced he's sailing around on his uh on his boat and yeah it sort of goes into like they ba well basically they meet in a bar uh she's trying to get a lift to florida he's about to leave in florida in like his kind of sailboat yacht type deal uh he gets warned by his friends told she's a really bad person he ignores that advice and then they get stuck on a boat together. Um, so yeah, I mean, this definitely isn't a book. I feel like I would recommend be like, everybody needs to read this book. But if you liked Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and then you wanted to like stay in this world and keep, uh, thinking these concepts and, and keep, uh, you know, kind of diving deeper into Persig's philosophy, then you definitely will want to read it. But if you don't, then it's definitely not like the best book uh, I've ever read or would like recommend 
Um, but to me, it was very necessary to read it. Um, this was cool too, because I just randomly bought this uh, at the bookstore in Nobby's and I had I'd actually always wanted to read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and then I bought this without oh, and I just saw it was from author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance I was like oh cool I'll just grab this um, read it first realized it was a sequel but it kind of I guess it didn't really fuck up too much it probably it, it probably did in a way but it didn't really take away from my experience of reading. Um, so yeah, first three books. I'll do a non-fiction one now. Um, this book is called The War of Art. Uh, I actually spoke about this book in uh, a pretty good detail with Matt McDuff. It was recommended to me by Andy Anderson, who was on the podcast, and also Davey uh, from the Hook, Art, Hook It podcast. Um, the Art of War, Break Through the Blocks and Win Your Inner Creative Battles. Uh, so Stephen Pressfield is an author. Uh, he wrote Gates of Fire. He wrote uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance. Um, and he is a bona fide G when it comes to the uh, literary world. Uh, but basically, this book is is for anybody that has any kind of inner battle where they want to do something, I'm going to do this, I'm going to start a blog, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to start a podcast, I'm going to start a business, I'm going to, I'm going to, going to, going to, going to, going to. If you're a gunner person, you're going to do this, going to do that, then you want to read this book because if you're going to do something, whatever it is that you're going to do, however big that is, um, there's an equally large force that will be pushing against you and telling you, that you are a piece of shit and that it won't work and that you'll fall on your face. Uh, that is called resistance as coined by Stephen Pressfield in this book. Um, and he breaks down what resistance is. Uh, resistance uh, recruits allies. Resistance only opposes in one direction. So he's just kind of got all of these uh, philosophical breakdowns. Uh, resistance and procrastination. Um, so he fully outlines what resistance is um, and all of the forms in which it will show up during your creative endeavors. Um, and then he kind of outlines how you skirt your way uh, around resistance. So for people just listening, this isn't a very big book. I think I read this in a day. Um, I sat down, it was a weekend, maybe it was like two days, like I read it over the weekend. Um, yeah, 160 pages, not a very big book, very easy to read. And I really, really enjoyed this book. This is a book that I'll read over and over and over again. Um, just purely because it's, it's just one of those books where it's like, damn, this is so simple. You can relate to everything. He's just articulated it in such a thoughtful way. Very accurate. He knows what he's talking about. This is no, like, this isn't a sexy, clickbaity type of book. Um, but it is so good and so worth reading. So that there's a bit of non-fiction goal for you. That's definitely on the 100% would recommend pile. Um, what else? All right, I'll talk about waking up i read it last year read bits of it again this year but it makes a list because it's very important um sam harris waking up new york times bestseller searching for spirituality without religion this is one of the most important books i've ever read uh it didn't impact me fully the first time that i read it uh I was, I feel like it's probably around the Taylor Cecil podcast. We really started talking about meditation. Um, the, I'd sort of been trying it, uh, wasn't able to be very consistent with it. Kind of all I really took from meditating is how fucking out of control my thoughts were. Uh, and then I guess I was just like everyone else and convinced that I wasn't doing it right or that I wasn't doing it properly or that I couldn't do it uh and that's the thing that literally everybody when i'm like oh you should do that oh i can't meditate okay cool well that is pretty much what everyone says and it's also like saying hey you should run a marathon oh i can't run a marathon well you could if you tried um and i was just kind of in that 
uh, mindset, but I just didn't really have the information. Um, so I reread this book again this year. Uh, at the very start of the year, when I got back from Bali, I recommended to a friend, she read it. Uh, and then in kind of me explaining a bunch of different stuff, um, to her, uh, things kind of clicked even more for me. Uh, I was able to make meditation a very serious, uh, pastime in 2020. It become a bit of a project of mine. Um, and there's a good, so I read, th I read this book. I read two books from the Dalai Lama. I read a book, um, by Sam Harris's wife, Annika Harris, uh, on consciousness. Um, I read a memoir from a Zen, uh, master. Um, and then I also read meditations from Marcus Aurelius. So we'll get into all those, but I honestly think for about four months of 2020, my, head and you've probably noticed it on the podcast i was just so balls deep in thinking about uh the concept of non-duality uh the concept of the self um and that was i guess a natural progression from it's it's really cool to be honest like it all kind of came through the podcast itself um because one of the things and i've said it a bunch of times on the podcast like the, my biggest fear of doing the podcast was that people would think that I would be doing it out of ego and that I was trying to be this thing and I was trying to be cool and I was blah, 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 blah. But to worry about that and to change my behavior, um, to try and affect that kind of outcome was actually coming from a place of ego. And then that kind of, I kind of hit the floor on that and I was like, well, fuck, really don't know what that means or where to go from from here uh and then so that is where this book come in again kind of like had a concept in my head of like all right so there's got to be something else because if me not wanting to have an ego equals having an ego then i'm going to be kind of stuck in this weird loop until i can figure this out um so then this book i read this book i put in a lot of time into the Sam Harris waking up app, uh, the daily meditations, the, I redid the intro course, but with like a, a real focus and, uh, attention. And then I also went into the app. They do a really, really good Q and a section. So all of the questions that I had where you, cause you're given, you're given these instructions by Sam and, uh, he'll be saying, now look for the one that's looking. And when you don't know what that means and you, you haven't really got the context of how that's being said, what the, um, the instruction is, am I supposed to think about this? Am I supposed to just be aware of it? Um, so I just feel like I didn't have all of the information that I needed. So I dived into this book again. I dived into the Q and A's. I started listening to people that had had these, uh, enlightenment experiences, people that had done hundreds and hundreds of hours of meditation. Uh, just to try and get my head around it so that when I was doing uh, my 10 minutes, 20 minutes every day, um, that I really felt like I was kind of getting uh, the benefit from it and I guess practicing the thing that I was supposed to be there doing. Um, so yeah, this book, absolutely huge. Um, I definitely would recommend this book to anybody. It explains a lot of the concepts um, of, I guess, just where like spirituality come from, uh, the concepts of non-duality, um, meditation. Uh, yeah. So, and then this in conjunction with the app is incredible. So Sam Harris's app is called waking up as well. Um, that is what I use every day and I listen to it constantly. I listen to all the podcasts that he's got in there. Um, it's become a real resource for me that is, uh, is super important. So this is definitely on the must read recommended wood smash list. Um, oh, this was one of the most enjoyable books I read in 2020. It was from Ernest Hemingway and is called Fiesta. The sun also rises. Uh, this is just a example of incredible writing, great characters, and written in a time that was, I don't really know how to describe it, but just, just pure, just right. 
Uh, none of the nonsense that goes on these days. Just some really good characters involved in a bit of a love triangle. Uh, essentially, there's a group of friends. They're kind of from different places around the globe. American, English, French, Italian. Um, they decide to take a trip to Spain for the fiesta, for the running of the bulls. Um, and then, yeah, there's a little bit of a love triangle that goes on. They only took one chick, like four dudes. They all loved her. Um, but yeah, Ernest Hemingway, just a fucking lord. Uh, this is a book that you could look at and be like, eh, I don't really know if that's for me, but this book's for everyone. This was absolutely a pleasure to read. Um, and I will endeavor to read more Ernest Hemingway uh, in the future. But yeah, this is this is a, an example of just really, really, really great fiction, really great characters. And this is one of those books where you forget that you're actually reading it. You're just doing it. Um, so yeah, can't recommend that one enough. Makes sense. Ernest Hemingway, one of the best writers of all time. Go figure. Uh, so I was recommended this by Kelly from next door. Shout out. Uh, Jack Kuriak on the road. She, uh, she said, if you like the flea book, you would love this. Uh, Jack Kuriak is the voice of the beat generation. I uh, created, I guess, like a whole movement. Uh, was one of the guys that inspired Hunter S. Thompson um, and a bunch of different writers. It kind of created this whole new style of American writing. Um, and I didn't really like it that much, to be honest. It was just like, I can appreciate it. I feel like that's probably the way to put it. It's like, I didn't really enjoy it. I did enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it. It was kind of a bit of a punish at times to read through. The last couple of chapters were probably the best. Um, but I can see how he influenced the generation. Like when you go from reading Hemingway to, uh, to this, they're not like super far apart in terms of time, but it's just such a different style of writing. Um, the content is so different. The way that it's written is so different. His memory, a lot of this was written. It's like, a, it's a fictional book, but it was kind of written pretty much based on him and some of his friends. Um, but yeah, like the memory that he has, the, the, the writing itself is so good, um, in terms of appreciating the art form, uh, that he was, you know, I guess like the way that he was presenting his art, but yeah, in terms of reading it it wasn't the most enjoyable book um it's a modern classic uh so definitely there's a fuckload of people that would disagree with me um but yeah it wasn't not my favorite book of 2020 but um yeah maybe you'd like reading it i don't know don't wanna, don't wanna steer you into that one um just because i didn't really enjoy it too too much um what next okay let's go to something i enjoyed more than I thought I would by about 350,000%. So, Thomas Harris, The Science of the Lambs. This book is so fucking good. Just going to pause on that. It is so fucking good. This book completely blew my mind. I read this book in... Just a few days as well, man. I was so fucking into it. And I just wanted to spend as much time with Hannibal Lecter as I possibly could. I did not know a book could be written this good, to be honest. Um, yeah, I've. if you've seen the movie, the movie's amazing. But I would read the book over the movie every single day of the week. Uh, the character development in this book, the story itself... The way, um, the way that it is like, I guess, paced out. Oh, unbelievable. I literally couldn't put this book down. So this is a 100% 10 out of 10 would recommend, would smash. If you are undecided about reading fiction and maybe you're like, oh man, I don't know. Like I probably just would rather read, read some nonfiction stuff, keep learning some different shit. You f cannot go wrong with this book. Uh, another book that is in that exact same category. I loved this movie, by the way. Um, so I knew that I was going to li li like the book. This was my first Stephen King book as well that I'd ever read. Um, but this literally copy everything I just said about this. 
about this. It's the same fucking thing. It is so insanely well written. Um, I absolutely pumped this book as well. I read this while we were on our Rocky trip um, and then our Cairns trip. And yeah, like there was one morning I sat on the beach for three hours and just read this, like couldn't stop reading it. Um, again, characters are incredible. The story is incredible. And I cried like a little bitch at the end of it. The, uh, the end of this book is, yeah, really, really fun fucking get you um but yeah these two books exact same category uh stephen king what a fucking g i just got uh, a full box set of his books for christmas thanks mum um so yeah i'll be reading a lot more of stephen king in 2020 but yeah the green mile um uh, for those of you who haven't or don't know or like haven't seen the movie it's an oscar-winning movie with tom hanks um and the the big black dude that is just enormous and an incredible actor fuck i can't remember his name um but yeah basically chronicles uh, a man on death row uh in a southern prison and the prison guards that guard him until they walk him to the electric chair and end him and it is a very 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 good book and yeah so this is another one this is, I guarantee you, if you pick up this book and you don't read much fiction and you finish this book, there is absolutely no way you won't think the same that I do. I, I couldn't see how anybody could not enjoy that book. Um, what else? Some random, random shit. Uh, this book changed the way I sleep. It is called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Uh, and this book was really, really good. I've always been, uh, I've always struggled to get up early. I've always been not a morning person. I never thought I would be able to be a, norm, a morning person and a normal person. Uh, but this book changed the way that I saw sleep. It changed my sleeping habits completely. Uh, it is now a non-negotiable for me not to get eight hours of sleep. And if I don't, I am off myself in a big way. Um, I use the bedtime thing that's built into your phone. So I set it every day, every day, 5.30, every day, bed at 9.30. Um, and that sometimes gets stretched out to 10. Uh, but yeah, eight hours sleep is a must for me now. Uh, the evidence that he puts forward in this book is so compelling. It's so interesting as well to find out just how little we know about sleep in general, like where we go when we're asleep. Uh, not a lot of people know. Uh, really interesting stuff around dreaming. Uh, so we all spend a third of our life sleeping. So I feel like it makes sense uh, to be educated on sleep. And yeah, this book but it's just a, like I said, a game changer. One thing that I really have tried, this is just a little bit of personal philosophy for y'all. Uh, one thing that I've really, really tried to do in 2020 is once I know something is better or worse or whatever, once I get this new information uh, and the facts are pretty undeniable, the way that the facts are undeniable in why we sleep, I just try to implement it. Uh, I think that there's been a lot of times in my life in the past where find some info out, makes sense. That's a really good idea. I should probably stop doing that, uh, but I just keep on fucking doing it. And for everything in my life, for as many ways as I can apply this, once I know something, I'm just fucking doing it, whether I want to do it or not. If we figured out that this is the right way to do it, it's probably the way that we should do it. Uh, so sleeping eight hours that's one of them. Meditating every day, that's another one of them. Eating good, that's another one of them. It's just shit that fucking we know works. And there's people that sort of don't do it. And I was one of those people. There's still a lot of holes uh, in the ship that take on water. Uh, I feel like I can shovel that stuff out or bucket it out. Um, so it's not taking me down. But there was definitely times where all the holes in the ship were really stopping me from fucking floating. Um, so that was one big thing what's the point of reading all this shit if you can't like you've learned it you've taken on this new information apply it to your life to make your life better otherwise what's the point 
Um, so yeah, Why We Sleep was another uh, was a book that really, really was like that for me. And I honestly, I pretty much, unless I've either A, smoked too much weed at night, or B, just gone to bed late and didn't get my eight hours sleep, I am now a morning person. I've frothed getting up at five or 5.30, reading, going to the gym. Absolutely love that shit. I don't ever want to go back to waking up even as late as 7.30. That to me, I feel like if I woke up at 7.30, I have just missed, literally missed a good coffee, an hour's worth of reading, and I'm three quarters of the way through the gym. So to me, being a morning person, huge perks. I don't really ever want to go back to not being a morning person. So uh, while we sleep, if you're looking for a great informative book, that's your fucking man right there. Also an international bestseller. Uh, another book, I don't have it here with me. Uh, I don't know where my physical copy of this book is gone. That pisses me off. But I will be buying another copy of it. This was probably the most profound book that I read in 2020 in terms of like, not the meditation stuff, but just another like a nonfiction book that I could practically apply to my life. Uh, it's called Atomic Habits. It's by James Clear. It's another bestseller. There's a bunch of podcasts that he's done as well. He actually did one with Sam Harris. Um, I'm not sure if that come out as like one of his free Making Sense uh, podcasts or not. Um, but fuck, it's so good. Uh, and that's another book where it's like, all right, cool. This info is pretty undeniable at this point. Uh, so I guess I'm just going to implement this in my life from now on. Uh, basically, <clears throat> one of the core principles of it that I think is super important um, is the fact that your goals that you have basically mean fuck all if your processes and habits don't line up with those goals. So there's an example that he uses early on in the book about the British cycling team uh, and that they were just the shittest cycling team in the world. Basically, they set a goal to win the Tour de France in five years. So they hired this new coach and he wasn't a cycling coach, but he came in with this approach of we're going to make everything 1% better. I think, it, I think they called it the marginal gains principle. Uh, and basically worked on the fact that if you got 1% better every single day, the compounding effect of that in 12 months would deliver these insane returns. Uh, there's a graph that breaks that down in the book. It's just a simple compound interest uh, graph. So if you get 1% better, 1% better over every single day, uh, you end up just hitting this insane curve. Uh, and I feel like I've been doing that for long enough now to kind of see those uh, gains accumulate in my own life. Uh, and so to go back to the cycling story, one of the things that he said was that every team had the goal of winning the Tour de France. So the goal was not the thing that gave you the yield. There was no, there was no yield that came directly from your goal. And it's the same way as if you're overweight and you say like, I want to lose 20 kilos. That actually doesn't mean anything if the systems in place um, and your processes don't actually reflect uh, what it would take to kind of achieve that goal. And that really made sense to me instantly. And it was like one of those things where I just couldn't unlearn that after I read that. Um, because I've always had goals and I've had these big goals that, you know, you kind of make and, you know, you sort of see a lot of people that, you know, will make like a new year's resolution and, and that's great. And goals are important to have, but I actually don't really value goals so much as I value processes now. Um, so because of this book, I just started to go like, all right, I need to just make all of my processes at least 1% better every day. So I just looked at all of the places in my life. And interestingly enough, so um, my best friend Shane, uh, he read this book as well, recommended this book to me. And uh, he's a guy that is super, super disciplined. He does meal preps on Sunday, just got his black belt in jujitsu, took him eight years of 
you know, really sticking to the process to make that happen. Uh, he's got his own jiu-jitsu academy. There's all of these things that have come to fruition for him in 2020 because he had the goal, but he also did the processes very, very, he was very strict at completing these processes. He knew that just wanting the goal of owning an academy or being a jiu-jitsu black belt, that wasn't enough. Uh, so he broke his life down, restricted himself. So like anything that I, I essentially like caused him to step outside of those processes, um, they, and that then would, I guess, deviate him away from the goal, kind of cut them out. So in association with reading this book, seeing the way that he moved through life in terms of training, the meal prep stuff, cleaning his house, like just everything that he did, he just had all of these bases covered. And before that, I'd say the way that I went about things is I kind of was like, all right, well, I'm just going to go fucking all in on work. And then if I get super successful at work, then I'll have enough money to just like pay for a cleaner, pay for someone to cook, pay for this, pay for that. But then I'll just, it'll just be the money. Like I'll just be successful with the work and then everything will come off the back of that. So that was kind of the way that I had it in my mind. And I've been working like that for pretty much ever. Like, honestly, I've owned my own business since I left high school. And that's pretty much been the mentality that I've had. And I can see that in people that are close to me is that they're like, I'm just going to make this happen. And then the rest will take care of itself. And it's like, maybe like there's a lot of luck involved in that. And there's also a lot of shit that can go wrong in between that. Um, so Shane was a big influence in saying like, Hey man, like, yeah, it's so sick that you're working so hard and you're doing all this and you're doing all that. But you know, like your house is pretty messy. Uh, you're not really like cooking for yourself. You're kind of eating out a lot. There's a, a lot of money in that. It's not super healthy. Um, yeah, I was like always dehydrated. I'd never drink enough water. And then that was affecting me. So like even down to the simple thing of if I just stay hydrated every day, there's a 1% gain there. There's more than a 1% gain essentially. But for the sake of this, just, just by being hydrated, you're staying that that's that 1% in that segment of your life, just by having good nutrition, good sleep. So you're suddenly like ticking all of these bases. You're just getting 1% better every single day. You are never really taking these dips. And then it's just this consistency over time will give you these results. And I started trying to apply this in all aspects of my life, whether that was training, whether that was work, um, processes with work became really important to me. Um, Ronan and I work off this database so that's very process driven. It's sort of, um, you know, on the outside, it, it might even seem like a little bit of a step backwards because it takes time to fill in the database, but that database is like an important process. And then, you know, becomes this like trackable thing. And every month was like, all right, 1%, 1%, 1%. Um, so that book, Atomic Habits, really, really, really did change the way uh, that I saw a bunch of stuff in my life. I think I'm a way better human for it. Uh, so that was a bit of a long winded one about that book in particular, but man made a huge difference in my life. And again, it just takes like, you read this shit. It's an international bestseller. James clear obviously knows more about building, uh, effective habits than I do. I'm just going to listen to the guy. I'm just going to put it into play. Uh, and I'm going to make it work. Um, speaking of water. This is a book by Ryan Holiday called Ego is the Enemy. Uh, he's written a lot of books. Um, he's a like a huge, huge author. Um, the Obstacle is the Way is another one. Uh, the Daily Stoic. I think his newest one is Lives of the Stoics, uh, which is really cool. So I have always been super into philosophy. Uh, that was, I saw philosophy as my way out in a in a way i guess like that was uh, if i could learn enough about philosophy generate enough wisdom that i would be able to navigate through the challenges of life and i think that's true 
in a sense. So I've always been very interested in philosophy. I've, I've read a lot of philosophy. I've studied a lot of philosophy. It's become, it's probably the thing, like I would have almost said that philosophy, if I had to say that I had a religion, philosophy would have been my religion. But what I've kind of found out in the last, well, 12 months specifically, like we'll say 2020 with the, I guess the, the deep dive that I took into uh, meditation and non-duality and the principles that are in there. Uh, that was kind of, I think, the missing link that then connected uh, to the philosophy. So um, I guess that the, the principles of non-duality really say that the self is an illusion. It's an appearance in consciousness in the same way that my voice coming through your speakers or headphones is appearing in your conscious experience. Uh, so we have this idea that we are the person that is shining the flashlight of attention through out consciousness. You, the you, the self that you are can aim consciousness uh, where you choose. You have this free will uh, and where the voice that's in our head that's driving the ship um, so in that sense, uh, so in, in, I guess, non-dual terms, um, that is called the self. Uh, so I was, I guess, on this path of trying to read as much philosophy as I could and really going into that because I wanted to be, I wanted to master myself. I wanted to really figure out, you know, the different ways that I thought and what, certain you know feelings meant what this meant what that meant and that i'd use that as a way to like guide myself through life and hopefully not fuck up too bad and not have you know be at the mercy of negative emotions and um you know not be at the mercy of anger and and jealousy and you know all the kind of negative shit that we experience as humans uh and then when you dive into more of the non-dual stuff and you if you can, I guess, subscribe to that way of thinking. Um, then you see that it's like, oh, okay, the self is. I can, I can see that the self is illusionary, illusory in that sense. That it is just an appearance. So if you kind of can get your head around that, um, then that is really like, I guess, the ultimate relief that you can find uh, in terms of mental suffering. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that we aren't this self and that this self isn't necessary because essentially, and I mean, I even had this, this thought oh, probably like maybe it was around like May, June when I was like really kind of all, honestly, all I was thinking about this was this stuff for probably three or four months. Like it really affected pretty much everything in my life was just how do I use this now? Like how do I get my head around just living a normal life with these sort of insights as, or, or these sorts of things as like a fundamental to the way I perceive the world now. Um, and I kind of was thinking, I was like, man, what's the fucking point? Like I get why these guys can just go and spend like 20 years meditating in a cave. Um, because you can kind of get to a place where the self is this illusory thing uh, and you can see through you can see through it and you can see where it comes from. Um, but then you kind of hit this crossroad of like, well, I do like being a person. I do like being me. I don't have a negative experience with myself. Um, the majority of the time, I feel like I would still like to continue being me. Um, and that's sort of, I guess the, that's really like the, the crossroads that people get at. Like when people just go off and join monasteries and I, I could never understand that um, until I kind of hit that, I guess, question or crossroad um, through reading this material. Um, but yeah, so anyway, long-winded rant there, but uh, Ego is the Enemy was one of the first books that I read after waking up around this kind of stuff. Um, and it kind of related back to that question I brought up earlier where it was like, okay, I want to have this sick podcast. I want it to be as big as it can be. Like, fuck, who knows? Maybe millions of people listen every month. Uh, but how did I, how could I detach the ego from that? And how could it be obvious that I'd, my ego was 
detach from that because I genuinely felt like I was doing it for the right reasons. I wasn't doing this out of ego. Um, and then I kind of hit that, uh, that point, that question that sort of, um, really led me down this path. So for while I was kind of in the initial phase of that, I read ego is the enemy. Um, some of it really, um, yeah, really kind of resonated. Uh, and then the more I read it, I sort of, yeah, it just didn't really hit with me. I think that saying ego is the enemy, um, is uh, like a good title for a book. Um, but I just don't think that that is true. Uh, the ego, the ego isn't even what it, I guess it's labeled in this book. I think the ego is given a negative connotation where it's like, oh, the ego is like the you that wants this and the, the you that will step on your um, grandmother's knee to get a fucking whatever, to get success or to have a nice car or whatever. Um, and I think it labels it in this kind of different context. And it's like the bad side and then there's a good side. But essentially the ego is everything. Um, so if you're not going to live inside a cave in the Himalayas, then ego can't be the enemy. Like it literally, that's what you are. That's what your sense of self is, is the ego. So I think to label it the enemy um, is, and and Ryan Holiday wasn't writing this book in this non-dual framework. So I'm kind of, I guess, butchering where he was trying to go with it. He wasn't sort of, he was talking about, I guess, that negative, um, that negative voice. But I just sort of stopped seeing it in that context. Um, but it was a really good starting point. Uh, I, I did enjoy most of it. Um, but yeah, I kind of... And, and it was one of those books too where I think that by the... Uh, by, you know, a third of the way through, you've, you've kind of got, got the gist. But for me, it was just a bit off base with some of the other stuff that I was reading and just found a little bit, um, a little bit more important. And I just... Yeah, I don't think ego is the enemy. I think ego is if you want to be a person that uh, walks through the world calling yourself a, a you, um, then the ego is that thing. And it's something that needs to, I guess you just got to reconcile. Um, Conscious by Annika Harris, A Brief Guide to the Fundamental Mystery of the Mind. Uh, this is a New York Times a bestseller. Uh, and it, I guess, essentially just tries to outline uh, what consciousness actually is. Um, why we're conscious, what the level of consciousness is in other species. Um, there's even some really interesting stuff uh, around people that have had the, like, the two halves of their brain separated and then there's two different like selves living within that brain they're two sets of memories and they're um, completely disconnected from each other and operating independently uh, that's a mystery to science um, and i think that this book really just illuminates like how much we don't know about what the conscious experience is why we're conscious what is the point of being conscious um so and and just this this is really cool too and this was like one of the i guess the coolest revelations that i kind of had this year through this sort of reading is just the fact that the way that we interpret the world is literally a mental projection like colors don't exist in, and this is you know this isn't i guess like a woo woo buddhism kind of thing it's like colors don't even exist in the way that we think we do we've got certain receptors that will like so red is the longest wavelength um and then the so we see red because it has the longest wavelength we see blue because it has the shortest wavelength so we've just got these receptors in the back of our eyes when light hits them different uh different wavelengths are reflected um off different color off different colors um so we see things in uh in we see things in color just because of what we essentially have built into into our eyes. But color just isn't even there in the way that we think it is. People that are colorblind see things completely differently. So this concept of what's real and the overall concept of reality in general um, is a lot more of this just mental projection um, that works really, really well. Um, and that's what we call real. But it's just such a limited scope of what is actually in terms of like the raw sensory 
data because that that's really all we are is where this walking bit of flesh that has all of these different senses that get amalgamated and joined together into one picture but there's so much shit that's going on around us and in the universe that we just don't have senses for so therefore it's just not real to us um so there was so many just i guess general um things in this book i i had no idea about it. and it really painted a uh a, a really cool picture of 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 i guess what we are what our conscious experience um what's responsible for our conscious experience in a way um and just how little that we do know about what is real what produces the reality that we have why there's a why there even seems to be a, a me that's in here qualifying the experience that i'm having so um super cool book really short book um I guess that goes to show how little we know about consciousness because there's not a very big book written about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, read this, I think I read this like on a Saturday. Uh, really enjoyed it. I'm definitely going to read it again. Uh, but it was kind of a, a part of that whole, I guess, uh, journey into uh, more of like a spiritual... I don't even know that spiritual is the right word. It doesn't really feel like spiritual. It just feels like... Uh, just knowing fuck i don't really know how to describe it to be honest it's just like you're objectively looking at what you're ex what is actually happening in your experience and what is being um you know manufactured through this vessel of like me and uh that i guess you call it the self uh while while we are on the topic of that um i read this book uh by henry shuckman called one blade of grass a zen memoir uh i read this book because he was on sam harris's podcast uh he is this was one of the interesting things this year i, I never really learned what i guess enlightenment even was i thought that it was like just this different state that you got to to where like pretty much you're fucking buddha tripping 24 7 uh but i've learned that's really not what it is well in my head i guess i've learned that's what it is um but to me nowadays i guess somebody that is enlightened is just seeing through uh, that illusionary that illusor illusory self pretty much in every moment they've got this ability to deconstruct um the i guess the self skewing the experience that they're actually having in any moment of time um so i learned that there was a few people that have had these famous uh they call them i guess awakenings where the i guess the ceiling drops or the floor drops out and there's no kind of box of of the self there's no they're not looking at the world as in his case henry anymore it's just they, they kind of describe this i was everything and nothing all at the same time that kind of deal um but he was i think 19 on a beach in chile and was just looking out over the sunset on the water uh, and that was enough to kind of put him into this state um which was i guess like a spontaneous kind of enlightened state um he had a very troubled childhood parents divorced it actually wasn't really that bad this is kind of a good example of a guy that really made his childhood worse than what it was uh in terms of like the family and stuff like that he did have this crazy case of eczema um that really that would have been a fucking gnarly deal but basically um he had this chronic eczema that was over his whole body for his whole childhood um and then when he went and did this trip in chile uh like his gap year after high school uh it went away and then when he returned to london it flared up again so in like he really spent 20 years of his adult life really just trying to figure it out he had he had a lot of baggage that he was carrying around a lot of these health issues um and yeah like zen and meditation was his way uh out of that um and he ended up being a zen master a zen teacher running a zen center um and he's actually uh a, an author so that's what he did as a profession um so this book is written so beautifully it's written like a novel um but it is his account of his life it's just the fact that he's such a brilliant writer um made it a really really enjoyable story um as well as very informative um but yeah it was cool like he honestly spent 20 years 
even doing Zen, I think he was probably doing Zen for 15 years before I think he really figured it out. Um, and it's all good to, I guess, be a good meditator. Um, but is that something that you carry into your everyday life? And what percentage are you living from that viewpoint of, I guess, selflessness and just kind of um, experience and not qualifying things as good or bad or positive or negative? Um and yeah, so this was, this was really interesting because I guess that sort of goes back to that question that I had before around like, all right, so what are you supposed to do with this like revelation of um, not having, you know, the self being this illusion? How do, how do you integrate that into real life? If you subscribe to that uh, way of thinking and that's something that you feel like you can investigate as a first person experience. Um, so this book was really dedicated to a guy that had had this experience, had s seen um, that, I guess, phenomena, um, and then spent 20 years trying to chase it to integrate it into living a good and happy life. Um, and yeah, so I really, and this was another one I, I really enjoyed, uh, and I could not put it down once I started it. Um, didn't highlight anyone anything that one but yeah unreal book um change the topic here probably getting a bit fucking redundant uh queen's gambit i this is cool all right so if you want to do the no tv thing and you know you want to like read a lot more everyone was talking about queen's gambit on netflix and i was like i'll watch the show and then i was like you know what i'll see if there's a book Turns out it was a book by Walter Tevis and he's the guy that wrote The Hustler, um, which is, I've actually got that ordered. Uh, I'll be reading that at some point this year. Um, so I was like, yeah, fuck it. I ain't going to cave. I'm not going to just do the Netflix thing. I'm going to read the book. And I'm so glad I did. I got it on the 30th of uh, December. So she just snuck in the 2020. I finished it in a few days. Absolutely loved it. It is about a girl called Beth who is an orphan. Uh, she gets sent to a uh, an orphanage, a girl's home, and she is taught how to play chess by the janitor. Uh, she turns into a prodigy, gets adopted, and fucking goes on a tear. Uh, this is a sick as fuck book. Really, really, really good. Um, what else have we got here? Getting there, guys. Getting there. Um, this was a cool little nonfiction read from a John Ronson. Uh, he is the, I guess the other Louis Theroux. Um, it's called them, uh, adventures with extremists. So he basically just follows around a bunch of these different people that you would, I guess, call extremists, like guys that are against the new world order, anarchists, um, Muslim extremists, uh, Nazis. He hangs around with the Ku Klux Klan. He's a small Jewish man, uh, which made a lot of these um, interactions quite interesting. Um, but basically, he wanted to make this book on extremists. And he wanted to make this book on extremists. And then he found this common theme that they were all talking about this new world order. Like everyone that had these extreme views were all scared of losing their freedom to this one world government, new world order type of deal. Uh, so then he ends up trying to find, uh, they all talk about this meeting that happens in a forest in, uh, in Northern California, um, where they burn like owl effigies and do child sacrifices and like all the conspiracy shit that I've heard a thousand times. They're fucking lizard people. Uh, he meets Alex Jones like 20 years ago, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, if you're familiar with Alex Jones, you know that he's on the forefront of all the crazy, uh, all the crazy conspiracy shit. Um, but yeah, it was a good read. Uh, not a book that I'd be like, you have to go and read this book. It was cool. It was a good read. Um, and definitely enjoyed it. Learned some shit. Um, but yeah, that's all I got to say about that one. It was good. Um, what else have we got? Uh, The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. I actually went through a bit of a phase where I just went down the bookstore, went into the Penguin Classics section and just bought a bunch of classics. Uh, you can't really go wrong. Uh, it's called a classic for a reason. Um, so this book was, uh, by 
a man called Niccolo Machiavelli. Uh, he was like, I guess, uh, I can't remember his exact position, but he was in the government essentially uh, in Florence and was uh, kind of working his way up. He was, I guess, in with a dude that ended up getting booted. So he got booted by proxy. Um, and then he wrote this book on essentially like being a ruler and it's gaining power, seizing power, uh, kind of laws and strategies that you had to do to be uh, a strong ruler. And on the back, there's a quote that says, if a ruler wants to survive, he must learn to stop being good. Uh, so this book was pretty cool because it was just written very, very matter of factly uh, and basically said that, yeah, you want to be the king, you got to fuck some people up and you can't really feel bad about it so he really went in and just like justified uh like generosity and meanness um cruelty and compassion whether it's better to be feared or loved and there's a lot of stuff where like this is not politically correct you can't say this shit anymore but you can see in modern times that all of these same i guess influences of human nature are still present but we're now, I guess, uh, shrouded in public correctness uh, that has kind of tinged the way that you present this kind of information. And this is written when you no one really gave a fuck. And I feel like this was probably even controversial uh, when it came out. But essentially, he wrote this as a manual to give to the new uh, people in power and say, if you follow these rules, you will be able to stay in power. Um, it even goes down to like, uh, um, like aligning yourself with other monarchies when it's okay, what you can expect. Like this was like a roadmap to seizing power and staying in power, like full Game of Thrones style. Um, it was written a really long time ago and it is still very relevant today uh, in terms of just how human nature works. Um, what a ruler should do to win respect. So yeah, uh, it's really, really interesting. Uh, not, a, not a big book, but I, I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed it. Not sure the practical application of it, um, but yeah, learning about history is never a bad thing. Uh, this, one of the coolest books that I read in 2020, Aldous Huxley, A Brave New World probably probably not a better time or year in human history to read brave new world than 2020 this is another book that um i actually started reading this before i knew it was a tv series but this is another example of everyone talking about a series you can just go back and read the book from all accounts the book is much better than the TV show. Uh, and the book is actually quite a lot different to the TV show as well. Um, Ryan, can you check if this is still recording and shit? Just do double check. Uh, yeah, it is. On both? Yep. Sick. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, it's apparently quite different to the book and the book's quite a lot better. Um, so basically it's like this dystopian future uh, where... Basically, no one has sex for reproduction anymore. Uh, all of the uh, children in the world, uh, there's no mothers, there's no fathers. Uh, people are just born in uh, these test tubes. They're raised in these uh, giant like fertility centers. Uh, you're then put into classes with like alphas and epsilons. Uh, so there's this like very clear structure of who's who. They all wear uh, different, uh, sorry, like one wears green clothes, blue clothes, brown clothes. Um, everybody's got their structure. Each uh, category of human has an essential sort of work that they do, a category of work that they do. Um, and there is a drug that people take called Soma, which is essentially like a, an enlightenment pill. Um, so they can take these doses of Soma. They call them going on Soma holidays. Um, but yeah, so then one of the alphas, he kind of doesn't fit into the alpha. The alphas are the top dogs. Uh, so he's trying to make a bit of a name for himself. Promiscuous sex is all the rage. Uh, you don't have sex to have kids. It's just purely like a status um, and recreational thing that you do. So this dude uh, doesn't get much pussy. So he wants to do something that can kind of make a name for himself. 
get him all the bitches, and he goes out into the uncivilized uh, world and actually, I don't want to give away too much, but finds a savage, brings the savage back, and uh, and then, yeah, the sort of the story goes from there. But this was written in the 40s, and it's fucking crazy to see. Uh, it's not like any of this shit is, like, true in the literal sense, but, man, we do live in a very, very class-dominated society, uh, more so than I think the average person thinks. Uh, we also have a lot more of an illusion of freedom than I think we like actually have freedom. Um, and then when you read this book, you're like, it's like the perfect world. They've kind of figured it out. There's no war. There's people aren't hungry. People aren't whatever. Um, but there is this like heavy control and you can't help thinking that that's not the move. Uh, but if you kind of look at ourselves 2020 you had to wear masks you can't really go anywhere uh we we really lost a lot of obvious freedoms um in 2020 but i think that if you really look back we sort of have given up a lot of legitimate freedom for order um in society and like i was even talking to this about dad uh, i was talking about this to dad um saying like Man, people think that we've had all these rights taken away from us just in 2020 or or that we're so easily controlled. But it's like, man, we've been stopping at traffic lights for a long time. Like we've been following the speed, the, um, the speed limit in roads. Like we really do live in a very well-ordered and well-controlled society. And the, for the more, I guess, the more order that you want in society, the more control um, you've got to give to somebody to, to make that happen. So Brave New World, fantastic book. I would recommend this to anybody that wants to uh, read a good fiction novel that kind of speculates on the future. Um, it was also written in the 40s, so you kind of get a look of, I guess, where his uh, Aldous Huxley's mind was at and that, you know, there is a lot of stuff that kind of uh, ended up ringing true in this one. Um Another cool, this was like, this is another like really cool read. Um, it's called Animal Farm. Uh, it is about a farm of animals. Crazy. Uh, and it is basically a farm of animals. They overrun the owners and then they create their own, uh, you wouldn't say political system, but that's kind of what it ends up uh, being. And it is, I guess, uh, it runs analogous to the Soviet Union and communism, uh, and how the principles of communism are, are great in theory. But when you, um, apply the principles of communism to, um, everyday life, you can see how it can go skew if pretty quickly. Uh, the pigs end up being the ones that, are. I guess the dictators uh, and the main pig is kind of modeled off Stalin. So uh, this was a really cool book. Uh, you just bang this one over in a couple of days um, and it's a good little read. The cool thing with some of these like smaller books, if you're, um, it's sort of what I was saying before, there's a real joy that you get from reading the last page of a book and then putting it on your little pile. So there's some good books here that aren't that big um, that you could really kind of sink your teeth into just to get your pile up, you know, like you might be able to read three of these in a month. Um, and then if you didn't read any books in 2020, you've upped your reading by like a trillion percent. Um, so you don't have to like get stuck into the biggest book, just get into something that's easy to read, get that good feeling that you get from turning the last page of a book. And then, uh, oh, that's another thing that I was going to sort of stay at the, say at the start. There's no days off either. Like I don't really, I'm not like, oh, I finished that book. I'll start another one next week or whatever. Like you just start your next book the next day. It's just, it's a constant thing uh, that, that you do. Um, and yeah, that would be like a piece of advice. I never really just stopped just because I finished one. Or if I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sort of always finishing the session of reading at the end. But I mean, yeah, even if you've only got like, for whatever reason, a few pages left, um, start your new one right away. Uh, this is a book that will become, I would say, a mainstay of my reading life. Um, I actually, I read this when I was hurt. Um, this was right as I fucked myself up. Um, and it become, 
Uh, this was like right in the thick of my, I guess, uh, meditation sort of stuff as well. Um, so I actually took the time when I read this book to highlight, um, to highlight all of the parts that were very, um, impactful on me. Um, it was crazy too, just because I was reading it with a broken hip, I couldn't really fucking move. Um, and I was sort of, it was like, it was honestly, it was super challenging. Um, so to be, you know, such a deep dive into the meditation stuff. Um, I was in a lot of pain as well. Um, and using the pain, I guess, as a, a bit of a reference point to put into practice some of the stuff that was uh, in this book in particular. Um, but yeah, so I really took the time um, to read uh, this slowly, thoroughly, and with a highlighter at all times. Um, and I'll just, on page 25, book four, Paragraph seven, read you what I highlighted. Remove the judgment and you have removed the thought, I am hurt. Remove the thought, I am hurt, and the hurt itself is removed. Um, so this book was written by Marcus Aurelius. Uh, he was the, uh, the emperor of the Roman Empire. Um, and he wasn't ever going to publish this. This was just like, I guess, his own personal kind of uh reflections that he wrote he was kind of getting into his old age he'd um he'd had he kind of reflects on his life the role that his grand uh like his grandparents played his father played his um uh, like tutor um played in his life and then so you can see i'm not sure if you can see but it's written in in these like uh parables i guess you could say i don't even know how you describe it but just like these little sort of paragraphs um, you know, there's one here, this isn't highlighted, but it said no action should be undertaken without aim or other than in conformity with the principle affirming to the art of life. And that's it. So it's just these random kind of paragraphs. Um, it's written in split into these books. I think there's seven books in all. Um, this was one of the, this was a, a line that I really, really liked. I highlighted this one. Uh, no retreat offers someone more quiet and relaxation than that into his own mind um so constantly give yourself this retreat and renew yourself the doctrines you will visit there should be few and fundamental sufficient at one meeting to wash away all of your pain and send you back free of resentment at what you must rejoin uh i absolutely love that uh paragraph and to be honest uh before I mean, this was right around the time where I was really finding out that there was a re retreat of quiet and relaxation that did exist in my own mind. And that did not exist before. Um, if you told me to just go and sit on a, on a cushion in my room with my eyes closed for an hour, I would have told you to fuck off. Um, and that would not have been a relaxing and enjoyable time for me. Um, but that has really I, I sort of i really took it seriously what a guy like marcus aurelia said you know like this book was written a long time ago like thousands of years ago um i should probably fucking check that that's true right but yeah i mean it was a long time ago um and it's all still the same like there's so much that goes on in our mind that is the same as then we really haven't changed a lot um so i really took this serious like if a book like this can exist for that long and go through all of the stages of humanity um that have happened in the time that has passed since and is still relevant then there is some real genuine wisdom in here um so yeah i really took the time i highlighted all of this book the whole way uh, through like here's another just randomly highlighted section um, that all is as thinking makes it so and you can control your thinking so remove your judgments whenever you wish and there is calm as the sailor rounding the cape finds smooth water and the welcome of a waveless bay like fuck me dead marcus you've nailed it um so yeah this is uh i'm so glad i took the time now too because i can just 
flick through and highlight uh, and read the highlighted sections now forever. Um, so yeah, this this was a really important book. I cherish this book uh, and the fact that yeah, to read through, um, to to go through and highlight everything that was relevant, um, and you know to be easily able to just pick this up, have them them quotes that just really you know hit you in the feels. Um, yeah, I'd definitely recommend anybody uh, at any stage of life taking the time to read. Uh, and reflect on this book um getting there guys getting there uh so this is a i'll keep this bit short uh on having no head there is a section in the waking up app uh that is on i guess this is again uh on having no head zen and the rediscovery of the obvious uh basically another guy that just had a random enlightenment experience was a man by the name of douglas harding i'm pretty sure i've kind of learned afterwards like he describes it in the book as he was standing in the himalayas he looked out uh onto the you know the mountains and the vista and he was completely taken back he lost his self he lost everything um and was just kind of at one with everything um you you do hear that a lot um in people like with you know the that are up in mountains and shit like that i think i've had similar experiences um when i've been in alaska and in the scottish highlands but i i don't think i had like contextual framework um for it to kind of mean anything to me at the time um i would explain there was one time uh like in a helicopter in alaska i actually fucking almost died too that was the time i almost fell out of that helicopter um which i've told a couple times on the podcast but yeah so that was a time where like i was pretty fucking gone like i was there wasn't really me there was just the uh kind of what was happening i was just in almost like disbelief of what i was seeing in this helicopter in alaska just these million year old glaciers that just went for as far as i could see um and i just said no i had nothing for that like i just i guess i was completely blown away um but when i would explain that i would just say like man it just made me feel so small um but i guess it kind of i guess that's true in a sense but it kind of makes you small enough to where you're sort of not even really there you're just having the experience um but anyway so douglas harding has this experience in the Himalayas um, and he actually related it back to, he just had this insight that he couldn't see his face. Like he couldn't see his head. He had no head. He was just the experience um, of, you know, like that corner of the universe at that time. Um, and then he kind of thought about this and, and uh, developed a philosophy um, around, well, they call it the headless way. Um, and it works off the principle that you don't, uh, you can't see your face. And if you objectively from the first person, um, look at what your experience is, it is just the world appearing in this kind of oval shape that is your, that is your face. And there's a level of self selflessness there when you kind of look back at what is looking out and you see that there's nothing there that just kind of is that experience um so yeah this was a <clears throat> this was a really cool book to read as well um went hand in hand again with the waking up app i go back to it but it's such a it's been just such a huge resource for me um and i can honestly say like i just really don't have bad days like there's just shit that used to be what I would say like objectively a bad thing that just doesn't really happen as much as it used to do. My moods don't really change as much. It's, things are just a lot more kind of level. And I don't think anything in my life has got particularly better or worse. Um, I just think that there's kind of some new tools in the toolbox. Uh, and all of this reading material has really aided in that. Um, so yeah, this is a book that I wouldn't recommend unless you're interested in that, obviously. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell anyone, like, you have to read this, you have to get into this shit, um, because you don't. But if you are interested in any of this stuff, if you have you know do any meditation at all, it's a really great book to read. Um, only a couple more left now. Um, I read two books this year from the Dalai Lama. One of them isn't here. I lent it to Katie. Uh, it is called the stages of meditation and it kind of just outlines the way like the steps that you would go through as a buddhist um, on the way to kind of enlightenment um, the different things that you start meditating on 
uh, the way, the times, the way that you should set up like your Buddha effigy um, to uh, meditate in front of. Um, it's really cool. Like a lot of a lot of the stuff that kind of helps you with meditation is uh, is analogies and you know comparing uh, comparing something that is it's so hard to really explain what is going on or the kind of what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I think that there's just over thousands and thousands of years of teaching. Um, the Buddhists have really come up with some incredible analogies, some great stories that can, I guess, help you um, to kind of find what it is that, uh, or like the context of, of what it is to be meditating right, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, how to see yourself as you really are, a practical guide to self knowledge uh, by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, uh, and then stages of meditation. Um, really, yeah, I enjoyed all of these. Um, I feel like the biggest thing is that Buddhists will kind of talk about is just like wisdom. Um, so I feel like, you know, you read these books, you can really gain an insight into some of the wisdom that uh, the Buddhists are trying to teach. And then you can carry that back into your everyday life. Uh, one cool practical example of this book helping me have like a bit of a realization in life that I feel like actually kind of helped me out and has kind of stuck with me um, is the Buddhist concept of attachment. Um, so in this book, uh, he was talking about the, if, if something, if something can, something doesn't cause you uh, joy or happiness, if when it's taken from you, it causes you sadness. That is just called attachment. Uh, and I feel like I've had a handle on this concept in terms of relationships before, where it's like, especially like breaking up with somebody. Like if someone breaks up with you, um, you know, then then they're just not that, they're not happy for whatever reason they want to leave the relationship. If you can't be happy for that person and you can only be sad, then that kind of, you never really loved that person. You just kind of wanted them there. Like it was more of a selfish endeavor. Um, so that was kind of how I related that in my own life before I read this book. But just the way that it was broke broken down uh, by the Dalai Lama, who knows his shit apparently, um, it really kind of made sense of just everything in my life. Uh, and I think it like literally helped me in most facets of my life, uh, particularly sharing a house with somebody. Um, and I noticed that in my past relationships, there was just a lot of general attachment, like this concept of mine, this is mine, that is mine, that's yours. Um, that all is from attachment. Um, and I had this one moment where this was in the thick of my fucking weirdness. Uh, me and my housemate, we rode down, we got lunch in Burley and I didn't have my bike lock on my bike. I got like a fucking $6,000 specialized <clears throat> and I left it out the front of the, um, of this place where we ordered. And I just noticed myself just like tripping on like looking at my bike to make sure no one had stolen my bike. That was like fucking 40 meters away from me. And, uh, And then I, I, I was reading this book at the time and I just thought, fuck, I'm super attached to that bike. Like there's a level of anxiety and unhappiness that I'm having right now purely because I'm scared at the thought of this bike being stolen. And if the bike wasn't even stolen and it was causing me this level of like distress and anxiety, and I'm kind of speaking in hyperbole here, but if you play it out to its nth degree then that's kind of where you land at but i was like i'm super attached to this bike like if i got if this bike got stolen right now i'd be fucking devoed like i'd be so upset that i didn't have this bike anymore and then i thought about what i just read um and i was like well fuck i'm attached to this like it's not really making me happy if someone takes this thing and i'm fucking completely devoed like what was the point of having it in the first place um so that's where like I, I don't practice like I'm a Buddhist. I don't have any intentions of being a Buddhist at any stage. Uh, but the wisdom and the insight that you can learn from guys that have been 
just literally it's been their entire existence and these uh, teachings have been passed down for thousands and thousands of years um it's very very valuable to read even if i don't consider myself a buddhist so uh any i think anything that you could read from the dalai lama would be pretty cool but i just think you've got to have a general handle on the concept of non-duality because essentially that's what buddhism is um that's what all of the like zen is but it's just you've got to be given that context of like this is non you're you're looking through this with a non-dual lens and i think that maybe one of the problems with buddhism is that's not what it is at the start it's about it's about a kind of a different thing and then you kind of hit that later on but i feel like if you don't have the concept of what you're sort of hunting with the whole non-duality thing um then a lot of it can kind of just go over your head uh another short novel that i would recommend everybody read uh it's by paulo coelho coelho uh, he's a brazilian dude called the alchemist this book has sold a fucking gojillion copies all around the world i first read this book when i was about 12 or 13 um my mum made me read it actually i didn't really want to read it um and yeah instantly became one of my favorite books i couldn't find my copy that i grew up with i was sure that i uh still had it um but anyway i didn't i wanted to read it i recommended it to a few people this year and said that i'd read it uh with them um so yeah i ended up rereading it it's basically a book about realizing your own personal destiny um so to realize one's destiny is a person's only obligation that's the only uh text on the back of this book um yeah this book has been a global global smash hit um truly uh profound book i think everybody should read it you should definitely give this to your kids to read too like it's a really easy story to read um and yeah it's uh definitely one i'll it won't be the last time i read it that's for sure um all right a couple more to go uh I'll run through this this book i haven't actually finished yet it's called naming the mind by kurt danzinger how psychology found its language uh how i found this book is on the lex friedman podcast um he had i wish i oh actually lisa feldman barrett uh was on the podcast with uh with lex friedman she is a neuroscientist i believe and she had 13 books that she recommended to all of her phd students to read before they graduated their phd uh so i bought a few of them because uh yeah like i said it's like you've kind of got this whole no self kind of concept and you need to live in that world for a certain percentage of the time and have that i think as your like foundation and your grounding that's the thing you kind of always go back to uh but then there's the aspect of if you don't want to just live in a cave in tibet uh then you're going to need some tools to navigate through life as a functioning human and essentially as a self and i think this is another cool thing that sam harris points out um in his waking up book is that the there's the reason there's probably a lot of people aren't or looked at spirituality as woo woo is because like all the fucking weirdness that surrounds that shit and it's kind of culty and it's kind of weird and it comes with all these attachments and like this stigma and this shit you've got to do and you've got to have fucking buddhas and incense and all that shit uh and i think that is very off-putting like i'm never gonna be wearing fuck okay never say never but i really can't see myself wearing robes and shit um and looking up to a guru and kind of like there's some weird shit that goes on like full sex cult sort of stuff so there's people and no doubt that when it comes to meditation and insights into non-duality and you know transcendental states of consciousness these gurus would have like they definitely would be elite level meditators but in terms of people they're kind of fuck-ups um so that's why i think it's like very important to have a real good basis of just psychology in general um and i guess the antidote to living a good life as a self um with an underpinning of understanding uh the illusory nature of that self um so books like naming the mind uh i got kind of like a quarter of the way into it um and then christmas happened i got given this book then i started reading uh queen's gambit 
Um, so yeah, this, it was just, fuck, honestly, I'm probably not smart enough to read it if I'm being completely honest, but I will persevere once I finish, uh, this book, which is called Chicken Hawk. Uh, and it is a book by Robert Mason. He was a Huey pilot in Vietnam. Uh, mum and dad got me this for Christmas as well as that, uh, Stephen King box set. Uh, and my family, like we love Vietnam. We do the Vietnam motorcycle tour every year. Uh, we won't be doing it this year, at least not in February when we normally do it. Um, and I've just been fascinated by Vietnam since I've been there. It's a beautiful country with beautiful people and you can physically see the effects of the war still. Like we, I took my drone and we'd fly the drone around and there is fucking bomb craters everywhere. There's so many places where you can't go because of mines. Um, so man, it was, it had a devastating impact on the Vietnamese, um, and their, the people and the culture. Um, uh, but I'd never really read too much about it. I think the most that I'd ever done was, uh, watch like some Netflix shit, like Vietnam in color and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I've really enjoyed reading this book. Um, crazy, crazy shit in this book like the level of death that happened in vietnam is fucking scary and the way that these guys like they're just on the ground and it's like they just get completely desensitized they're like oh well fuck they it's almost like they just resigned to the fact that they weren't gonna make it they every single landing zone that these heli pilots landed in was under constant fire like no landing zone they essentially just like flattened out a circle in the fucking jungle in a clearing to land these planes in and there was just it's like they're giving away their position every time that they're flying in you can hear the fucking choppers coming from literally miles away and then it they were just getting ambushed man and just like constantly fucking just tore to bits uh and so robert mason they ended up calling him lucky because man this dude just the the shit that he pulled off and the the times that he got out when other guys were literally fucking blown apart, uh, is incredible. So I've, I've got, I think a hundred pages left of this to go really cool, a really good look at the war. Um, and yeah, like I've found myself really excited to get up in the mornings and, uh, and read. So great book, Chicken Hawk by Robert Mason, uh, thoroughly enjoying this one. Um, shit, that's last book. I wanted to save this one till last because this was a very, very satisfying book for me. Uh, it's called A Gentleman in Moscow. It is written by Amor Tolls. And the coolest thing about this book is I just walked up to the bestseller list on the, uh, at the bookstore and I just picked it up because it had a cool cover. And I don't really ever do that. Uh, I normally know what I'm going to read, uh, this year I've definitely, I've done that more. Um, but yeah, this was like, this is a big book with small writing, um, 500 pages. Uh, it was when I was hurt. Um, so I spent a lot, I actually read this a lot in hospital. Um, when I was laying there thinking that I was going to have to have my spine fused, which was a fucking scary deal. Um, so I kind of just dived into this book. This was one of those books where, I'd read it for like two, three hours at a time, forget the troubles of having a broken hip and all of the shit that went along with that. Um, but the story itself. So I guess, yeah, it was this random book that I picked up and holy shit, I enjoyed it so, so, so much. I'll, I feel like this is a book I'm going to read again at some point. And when I'm an old man, I feel like I'll enjoy reading this book and it'll <clears throat> make me reminisce on the kind of the time uh when i was younger and read it uh, i could really see that happening um but the storyline is uh this russian aristocrat it's when the soviet union first takes power uh he was a poet wrote a, a poem that was i guess not flattering to uh the new regime but because he was a, Ru a Russian aristocrat and someone of high prominence in society, uh, they couldn't just execute him. So they put him on house arrest, which was very, very, very popular um, when the Soviet Union came in to where you just literally couldn't leave your house ever. 
again. Um, so he lived in the Hotel Metropole, which is this amazing hotel in uh, the rest Red Square in Moscow. He had this beautiful suite, but they said, you can't live in your suite. You've got to live in the attic. So uh, they moved all of the possessions that he had that would fit, which is fuck all, um, into this attic. And he lived in the attic of the Hotel Metropole for 40 years. And this story followed his 40-year journey of house arrest in a hotel. And holy shit, it was incredible. I am going to stay in the Hotel Metropole at some point in my life. And I'm going to read this book for a little bit while I'm in there. It was so incredibly well written. The story was amazing. Um, the emotion that I felt reading um, this book. Oh, I just went to a... Uh, Oh, dude, I remember this line. I actually highlighted a line randomly in here. This resonated with me a lot. Nina Kolakova always was and would be a serious soul in search of serious ideas to be serious about. I don't know if there's one sentence in a book that I would subscribe to myself in like that would fit any better. Uh, this book was full of that. And that, that was one of, that's an example of like, you can really learn a lot about, uh, about life through really great fiction. Um, and that was, yeah, that's a, that's a really great example of that. Like I've always, you know, people there's sometimes like, I know my brother fucking gets annoyed, but yeah, I'm always just so serious. And every conversation I have is like a deep conversation um, it's almost to a detriment, but for whatever reason, that's just me. I'm a serious soul in search of serious ideas to be serious about. And yeah, it's just an, a, another example of just incredible writing that can just, that one sentence can just sum up a character so well. And that could be me, you know, it's just, I guess it's a cool, like it's just circumstance that it relates back to me. But I mean, that could easily have summed up my brother in one sentence or my dad in a sentence or my partner or my friend or whoever it is. And I think that just that one line can just really encapsulate a person, sum someone up and you can just look and, and read that and be like, man, all right, I get you. Like I get you in that, just in that one line. Um, so yeah, anyway, I fucking love this book. Uh, very rewarding to just walk into a bookstore and grab something off a shelf and have it be so incredible. Uh, and then that gives you confidence to walk into the bookstore again, uh, and read, you know, and, and kind of know that it's possible to have such an amazing experience, um, with the book. So save that one till last. That was my red pile for 2020. It was a special year of reading books. I'll line these bad boys up. Um, yeah, it was a special year of reading books. I enjoyed every single day that I read, except for a couple of times reading on the road. That book started giving me the shits. But yeah, that's my little tower of uh, awesome literature. Not sure how many pages there would be. It'd actually be cool to kind of figure that out. Um, but yeah, so... Thank you for listening. If you listen to all of this, um, I could probably go through and put a link in the description of wherever this is posted um, to everything uh, that I read. And please DM me about any of these books. Um, if you're at all interested, I'd love to talk about them. Uh, talk about them with you. Just talked about them here. Um, quick little, just try and give you like a quick little overview of shit that you should read. Um, Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises. Great novel. Oh, I also read, fuck, before I forget. Uh, I read a Roald Dahl book of short stories that was really great. I think it was called something Henry Sugar and a uh, short story, Henry Sugar and Six More or something. Roald Dahl was one of my favorite authors as a kid. I read so much Roald Dahl. I think I read almost every one of his books and his biography as a kid. Um, and then that one somehow slipped through the cracks. It was like a $6 find at a bookstore. Um, so yeah, I read that one as well. Uh, but yeah, Ernest Hemingway, Sun Also Rises, incredible. Read that. Sam Harris, Waking Up, must read. War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, must read. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, hard read, 
but fucking awesome. Uh, Green Mile, Stephen King, Tom Harris, Silence of the Lambs. Definitely read those. Why We Sleep is great. You could do the audio book. Get away with that. I'll give you a pass. Uh, you just want the info out of that one. Conscious by Annika Harris was incredible. Um, Queen's Gambit, great. Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, great. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, Meditations, 100% everyone should read that. And uh, Paulo Kelly, The Alchemist, is a must read as well. Um, so yeah, that's it. I've got a list of books over here. This is getting kind of long. Um, but yeah, so... Um, oh, I also read Plato, the Republic. I got like three quarters of the way through that. And then I was just like, I'm fucking cooked. So I just started reading some easy shit. Um, so some of the books that I've got lined up to read, this is my little, um, pile of 2021 shit. I have Plato, the Republic. I'll finish that. Nietzsche beyond good and evil. Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. That's a productivity book. Um, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Really want to read that. Actually, um, the Mere Mortals podcast, guys, I watched like a little one-minute book review on that. Um, so I'll be reading that very, very soon. Uh, Homer's Odyssey. Uh, that was referred to so much in Plato, The Republic. Um, so I'll read that. Uh, Passage to India. Not sure if I'll read that. That's another Penguin classic. I'll read it at some point, but not sure if it's going to be this year. Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. That is about the Battle of Thermopylae, which was turned into uh, the um, movie 300. Oh, also, I didn't talk about... Uh, I read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Uh, that was awesome. I felt like a dumb cunt reading that book, though. Uh, there are some fucking smart people in this world. Uh, but yeah, I had a couple like brain explosion moments, like how the how they found out that the universe was expanding. Essentially, uh, they just received or they just can detect radiation in every single direction of the uni universe in a fairly uniform way. Um, and that the things that were the furthest away in the universe were all red light, um, which means that the light was expand I'm probably fucking this up but anyway um they had basically gone from red light to uh x-rays and gamma rays uh, which were like the longer waveforms of light um so yeah a bunch of just little brain explosion stuff that happened um that was really really cool to read uh i got carl sagan's cosmos um uh, so that'll be kind of the next dive into uh, the universe sort of stuff. Uh, Beak of the Finch, that was another one of the Lisa Feldman Barrett books that she recommended to her PhD students. Um, Biology is Ideology, that's another one from her. Um, Aldous Huxley, Doors of Perception. Um, I read most of that. It was about him on a mescaline trip, and then I just didn't really feel like reading it. Um, it's a small book. I just need to finish that one off. Uh, and then Lisa Feldman Barrett, her book, How Emotions Are Made. I'm super interested to read that. Uh, and then Lachlan Giles recommended me. Lachlan Giles stitched me up. No, actually, he told me to get the audio book uh, and read the audio book or listen to the audio book. And I was like, nah, nah, I love the physical books. Get a fucking load. Ooh. Get a load of the size of this thing. Mutiny on the Bounty, Peter Fitzsimmons, great Australian author. Uh, how many? Yeah, it's like 600 pages long, man. Um, so yeah, that's the story of the Mutiny on the Bounty, a saga of survival, sex, sedition, mayhem, and mutiny. Uh, and yeah, like you said, this book was incredible. So um, I will tackle that at some point. Um, pretty intimidated by 600 pages not gonna lie he said the audiobook is incredible um so yeah if one of my goals this year is to read a little bit more history i went very in depth in terms of the conscious experience and spirituality uh philosophy that trend continued that's always been something i've been super into um but yeah, I'd like to learn a little bit more about history this year, uh, read some more great novels. Honestly, can't say enough about The Green Mile and Science of the Lambs. So if you want to read some fiction, dive head first into those. Uh, you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much. And again, if anybody has any questions about books, about reading in general, uh, I just, yeah, I could not 
be quicker to offer my help in any way. It is such an incredibly rewarding thing to do. Uh, I love every day that I sit down and read. Uh, it is truly one of the joys I have in life. And I would love to be able to help uh, spread a little bit of that joy. There's also a pretty solid little contingent of the Gypsy Gang that is reading. We do talk about a lot of books together. Um, that makes me stoked. So anyway, thank you all for listening to this. Uh, hopefully it was interesting. Um, and yeah, let's talk about more books in the future.